different strategies were studied and applied gradually, in those academies in which there might be more resistance by some families to the future fusion of school and academy. The most important means used were the decision to not open an academy where a school existed, and vice versa, the shared use of some facilities in the buildings where both types of center coexisted, and the study of a scholarship plan, so that the more talented students of our schools would be able to attend academy classes. 3. A bold mission, the educational works in Japan. The first group of handmaids arrived in Japan on November 9, 1934. Little by little, through self-abnegation and a great love for Jesus Christ, they created and consolidated, in a very few years, an educational work of great proportions and one that was at the same time very promising in every way. Those first sisters cannot help but awaken in us a profound admiration. It has to encourage us profoundly to see how the divine heart of Jesus has chosen from among ours those who bring knowledge of the same heart, let us unite ourselves to our sisters, let us pray and sacrifice ourselves in union with them, so that their work may be fruitful, and sharing in their labor, let us share as well in the immense consolation of drawing souls to Christ. The Japanese people grasped the dedication of our sisters and enveloped the handmaids in an atmosphere of affection, trust, and esteem. Soon the first vocations for the institute entered, and by 1964, there were more than 80 Japanese handmaids. To the initial difficulties were added those caused by the war, with everything that it entailed in the way of suffering and struggles for the Japanese people, and for our missionaries as well, without a house, because the Tokyo house had been destroyed by fire and exhausted by terrible privations of every kind. They began again from nothing with the boldness of those who trust more in God than in their own strength. Those first handmaids realized, as soon as they arrived, that education, considered so important in Japan, could offer them an ample field for evangelization. It was, without a doubt, the most fruitful apostolate possible and one in which they could lay strong foundations for the future. In fact, in those times, almost all the conversions took place through our educational centers. In Nagano, a city deeply rooted in the Buddhist tradition, we founded the first Japanese academy, after the war, in 1946. In 1947 the Academy of Yokosuka followed, which began with 534 students of both sexes, and from the very beginning, with various levels of instruction. Its beginnings could not have been better, and very soon it was the largest academy of the institute. Almost from the very start, it had to rely on the collaboration of Catholic lay teachers since there were not enough handmaids. The third Japanese academy was that of Kamakura, a daughter school of the Yokosuka Academy. In 1953 it became an independent academy. A very important and complex educational work was the Catholic Women's College of Yokosuka, created in 1950. The ups and downs that it experienced since its foundation were significant, soon it was evident that this city was not the right place for the university. It was necessary to move it to Tokyo, but how? The future of the College of Yokosuka, the masterpiece of our mission, stands before us today as an undecipherable riddle. Will it disappear as quickly as it came to life, or is all of this simply proof that this work is truly beloved by God and must therefore experience setbacks? Time will tell. Meanwhile, we continue to work and struggle to stay on course, as if everything depended on us, but trusting fully that in the end, God our Lord knows what he's doing and often writes straight with crooked lines. After more than 10 years of anxiety and uncertainty, in 1964 the long for move to Tokyo took place. This year stands out in the history of our Japanese mission as one of the most memorable. The decision was risky, but God's time had arrived. From this point on, an important restructuring of our Japanese educational works began, with the focal point being the College of Tokyo. The work of the Japanese mission could not have been accomplished with only human wisdom. When we contemplate the enormous educational work that our missionaries carried out, we have to think, almost automatically, that they, with simple and sincere humility, must have repeated more than once that phrase of Saint Raphaela, we have not founded anything, it is the sacred heart of Jesus that has done it all. 4. Apostolic efforts multiply. While it is true that the free schools and the academies occupied pride of place in these years, it is also true that our sisters offered other educational presences that were very directly linked to the world of education. 
It is not the object of this book to study these works in depth. We shall only touch upon those which have been most significant in the history and development of the congregation. Both the former and the latter express the importance of educational works for the Institute. Aspirancy Academies We have seen in the previous chapter that there had already been some tentative attempts to establish this type of work in 1917, but in practice it enjoyed little success. Many years later, in the first Congress of Sister Educators, celebrated in Italy 33, the topic of the decrease in vocations to the consecrated life was extensively discussed. A year later, Pope Pius Roman XII received the superiors general of the Institutes of Pontifical Rite, who were present at the Second International Congress, and addressed that very topic with great concern. You know that women's orders are passing through a grave crisis, we refer to the decrease in the number of vocations, a disturbing development in several European countries. From this moment on, the idea of establishing aspirancy academies appropriate for the times was considered as a way to promote vocations. In 1955, the Hispano-American Aspirancy Academy was founded. As its name implies, its purpose was to meet the need for vocations for Latin America, Almost all of the students came from our educational centers. In addition to possessing certain human and intellectual qualities, students had to evince a certain appreciation for the religious life, the fact that they studied with the juniors and had frequent and close association with them was certainly helpful, for many vocations came from this academy. Following this, similar academies were established in Philadelphia 1957, Highcliffe 1958 and Upwater 1960. In the number of students, the duration of the academies, and the results, these schools paled in comparison with the aforementioned Aspirancy Academy of Valid. University Housing In the 1950s, women began attending universities in ever greater numbers. The church did not delay in calling for university housing with the aim of ministering to young women who had to leave home in order to attend prestigious universities. Despite being nearly always a difficult mission, this apostolate was also fruitful. It is not strange that the bishops contemplate the housing offered by sisters with approval and a certain sense of relief. If these dorms were greater in number, the problem would be solved in part, the young women could count on having a second home. Our sisters strove to give these works an atmosphere of togetherness and family spirit, we spared no effort in ensuring that the university students were formed in the aspects of life that universities did not offer. The first university residences were those of Parma, Milan, and Bologna. After these, the following residences, in order, were Ovido, Zaragoza, Sevilla, Granada, Burgos, and Paraná. These were all highly sought after and had to turn away with regret many young women. In 1964, there were 445 residents. The House of Studies of London 37, although structured differently, had a similar objective. As the years passed, the parents of our academy alumni became more persistent in their desire for their daughters to complete their education with fluency in English. Concerned for the welfare of their daughters, parents did not see this as feasible except under the care of the handmaids of the Sacred Heart. This house had, therefore, a markedly international character. educational collaboration with other entities. The Institute did not lose sight of the importance of collaborating in educational works that were not our own, but which corresponded with the charism given to our foundresses. A major opportunity for evangelization presented itself, one with unexpected possibilities for the future and with important societal implications. One of the experiments supported with great enthusiasm was that of the normal schools of Peru, on May 29, 1959, Mother's General who resided in Rome were convoked, and church spokespersons described the grave problems that the Catholic Church was suffering in Latin America, because of the influence of Protestantism, and most of all, because of the infiltration of communism into intellectual circles. Our institute did not delay in responding, and Mother Cristina Estrada wrote to the provincials of Spain. This letter will encourage all of us in our care for the apostolic works we have established in Latin America and the desire to cooperate ever more actively in them. I refer not only to the works already in existence, but also to those which, according to our vocation and institute, we will be able to help develop. I want to consider with you in what form 
we could respond to the petition, which the Pontifical Commission for Latin America addresses to us when it says, what would the holy founders and foundresses of your institute have done if they were here today? Following their example, increase your apostolic efforts in facing the needs of today's world. We feel the urgent need for a response especially in these moments of danger for the faith of the so many sons and daughters of the church in the South American continent. The response was not long in coming. On June 18, 1961, the Minister of Education of Peru received the mothers charged with finishing up the details before finalizing the contract of the normal school for women, a work so longed for by the Institute, and told them, in writing, I approve the normal school of Arequipa if the normal school of Chota is accepted. Once again, the congregation responded generously to this new call. On August 25th of the same year, there arrived an almost laconic message, Chota approved, Christina, in the following school year, four normal schools were functioning in Peru, two in Chota, one rural and one urban, and another two in Arequipa, one of them an extension of the Catholic University. These offered us an immense field of apostolate in their respective regions, especially in Chota, since there had not been religious sisters there prior to our arrival. One can easily understand how important it was for us, as educators, to have the ability to work in this apostolic field. The goal was an important one forming good Catholic teachers, which was equivalent to saying, very soon you will have in your hands the future of generations to come. Another teaching work that had a markedly social character, and was very new for the Institute depended on a state entity, the Virgin de la Vittoria Home, in Torre del Mar Malaga. In this boarding facility, there were 212 girls who lacked almost everything, as one of their teachers tells us. They are so needy, and they have discovered here a warm home with an atmosphere permeated with love and understanding in which we sisters also are happy to exhaust ourselves for the good of these souls, so young in age, and yet so advanced already in suffering. Many more interesting examples could be added, such as the Academy of Prudge in 1957, or the parochial school of Baltimore in 1959. New educational styles were opening up for the congregation. These challenges must be seen through the lens of God's will for us. 5. The most comprehensive training possible. The apostolic educational activities being developed and carried out in the Institute, following the spirit of the Constitutions, were now numerous and important, as we have seen. The lack of well-prepared personnel sometimes made it difficult to accomplish some projects. Moreover, the Church too was advocating further formation for sisters. We would ask you to be mindful in a special way of the demands of schools and education, our ardent desire is that they all be excellent. This however implies that your teaching sisters know and assimilate perfectly what they teach. Take care in obtaining for them a good preparation and formation, which satisfies the requirements of quality and certifications demanded by the state. Although the Juniorates had been created in 1915, and general congregations via and Roman 7 promulgated some decrees about them, it was General Congregation Roman 8 which provided stable regulation for the Juniorates in Chapter 5. The congregation wants to establish and give a fixed form to the Juniorates, and hereby declares them definitively constituted in the Institute. In this same chapter the minimum level of education that the mothers must achieve by the end of their formation was determined, namely, it should be what is required for a teaching degree in Spain. In other nations, it will be determined according to the requirements of the country and the equivalence of the level of studies. Dispensation from this minimum level of education is reserved to the Mother General. After this general congregation, four international juniorates were established, Valladolid, Barcelona, Rome, and London, and an additional two at the national level, Philadelphia and Yakasuka. Creating this type of juniorate made it possible to reduce the number of provincial juniorates. At this time, new foundations were not being accepted, and it was not necessary to close any of the houses and works already established. In all of the juniorates, sisters were able to obtain academic degrees which enabled them to carry out a greater service to God and the Church. And this is something I want to point out to them in a special way, how the studies to which they will dedicate themselves have to be impregnated with the spirit of reparation and directed to carrying out more fully the mission which God has entrusted to our Institute. Today, when education is no longer the privilege of a few, but is extended to ever greater numbers, it is impossible to maintain the prestige required to do good to souls, 
even in the case of simple peoples, without uniting, to solid virtue and sensitivity in dealing with people, a wealth of knowledge beyond what is common. For this reason, it is not just those who will be dedicated to teaching, but rather everyone, who must give themselves to study with determination and with the noble aim that the Institute may be capable of serving God and His Holy Church in everything with which He and she deign to entrust her. From 1952 onwards, a system of competency acquisition was organized. The goal was that those who were dedicated to teaching maintain an up-to-date knowledge base and become specialized in one or two subjects, with the aim of becoming competent educators. The organization of these classes was entrusted to provincial superiors. In practice, it was the General Secretariat of Studies, in collaboration with the Provincial Prefects of Studies, which implemented it. Its effects on the teaching staffs soon became evident. Theological formation was also the object of attention and regulation. In July 1953, summer courses entitled Higher Studies in Religion began in La Coruña. Their purpose was clear. Provide our sisters who cannot attend the Pontifical Institute, Regina Mundi, of Rome with a solid grasp of the holy sciences, which will prepare them for greater personal perfection, for carrying out roles in government and formation within the Institute, and for apostolic work, especially as religion teachers. In view of the fruits obtained by this, Center of Higher Studies of Religion, in its first five years of functioning, on January 10, 1958 the Sacred Congregation of Religious joined it to the Pontifical Institute, Regina Mundi, located in Rome. It was afterwards known as the Institute of Sacred Sciences Lux Vera. Another important step was made when General Congregation Roman IX approved the Houses of Formation for Lay Sisters. At that time many were already working in schools and academies as support staff and teachers of manual tasks. In the establishment of formation houses, it was set forth that a. During two years, upon completing the novitiate, they will be gathered in a house especially designated for this purpose, where, they will continue their formation in the spiritual life and acquire what will be useful for the various offices they will need to carry out. d. These houses of formation will be provincial or interprovincial, according to what is best in the opinion of Mother General. Between 1950 and 1964, the following degrees were obtained in the various Juniorates, 84 bachelor's degrees, 157 teacher certifications, 33 degrees of higher studies in religion, and 18 other types of certification. In the houses of formation of lay sisters 107 diplomas were given in home economics, typing, nursing, and more. In addition, there were 230 competency acquisitions completed during the summers. The effort and sacrifice which the rapid implementation of the legislation of General Congregation Roman VIII required produced very good results. From this painstaking plan flowed very important benefits for our works of zeal in general, and in a very special way, for all of our educational works. 6. Trust and Transition. We have shown, albeit in a tentative and superficial way, the great vitality of the Institute in the area of education during this time period. The congregation, as in other moments of its history, listened to God's calls issued by means of the church in the world. To new challenges, the congregation offered new responses, which stemmed, once again, from the dynamism that comes from the reparative charism given us by our foundresses. New apostolic works, not always easy to manage, were begun, and were able to continue, because there was very clear conviction that, Although we may be small because indeed we are small, and if some member of our congregation thought herself important, she would be worthy of an asylum our aspirations, depending on God, must be very great indeed. On December 29, 1964, Mother Christina made public her resignation from the office of General. With simplicity and humility she had accepted the charge, in difficult and delicate circumstances, seeing in it the will of God. After 32 years in government, she manifested her desire to leave it, also out of love for the Institute. The Holy See accepted her desire on November 9. Everyone, I am sure, will understand the reasons which have moved me to take this step. The 32 years of carrying out such a responsibility and my now advanced age have reduced my vigor. I no longer have the strength needed to lead the Institute. If these reasons be valid at any point, even more so are they valid in this present time in which we live and look ahead toward a future which already seems clear to our eyes. The Institute has to participate in the renewal of the Church and follow the path she is indicating, a task which requires strength and energy that exceeds my own. 
As an auditor at the Second Vatican Council, she knew well what the word renewal implied in the broadest meaning of the term. In this way, she closed an important chapter in the history of the Institute. Already, the fresh air of the Council was being felt, air that would bring new dreams and hopes to religious life. Chapter 4. Education from Vatican II to Today. 1965-2004. 1. Renewal in the Spirit. The 25th of January of 1965 marked the opening of a new stage in the history of the Institute, with the election of SR. Maria Luisa Landesho as Superior General. On that day, Mother Cristina Estrada gave her a case that contained a gold coin and a parchment on which was written, A coin of finest gold, the Institute passes into your hands today. It has been forged and refined by our blessed foundress in her own spirit, and endowed by God with new apostolic strength throughout the years. It is he who will cause its worth to appreciate, adding to it living carrots. He will make our Institute, always faithful to the heart of Christ, be in every moment his instrument, given to the Church Rome, January 25, 1965. Christina Estrada, Aksh. At this time the fresh air of Vatican II's renewal and openness was already being felt. This council would lead the Church far beyond what anyone could have foreseen, and its rich teachings would direct the future actions of the Institute. These 36 years in the educational history of the congregation have been complex ones, full of endless searching revisions and new responses years of openness to the Spirit, with all that such openness involves in terms of provisionality and often even suffering. Our foundational charism today does not remain static, a mere projection of the past ideas of our foundresses. Rather, its dynamism, fruit of the Spirit, is filled with a great potential that time and history develop appropriately now as in other times giving the responses that society and the Church ask of us. All the winds were in our favor in the first post-conciliar moments. The conciliar decree perfecti caritatis urge religious institutes to study how best to renew themselves and accommodate their way of life to the conditions of the world, with a view to the mission which by their vocation, they were called to undertake in the world. The latter part of the 20th century was marked by attention to this task, in this climate of renewal. It is good for the Church that every institute have its own character and function. Our Lord having given founders the charism that illuminates the carrying out of the work that inspired them, a charism proved by the Church, it is natural that any renewal of the institute must recognize and conserve that foundational grace poured into the life of every religious order and alive within it. The institute is part of the Church and its life, undertaking, and aspirations must coincide with those of the Church, in the measure determined by the objectives and functions for which it was founded and approved. On this point, we must ponder what contribution our Institute, in accord with its specific nature, will offer to the conciliar work of Church, Newell or Girnamento. We do this first of all in order to assimilate it within the Institute, and then in order to promote it in all of the Institute's works. Pope John Paul II will return to this same idea some years later. In order to address well the great challenges that current events pose for the new evangelization, fidelity to the founding charism is important, this requires a serious discernment of the calls that the Spirit issues to each institute. In these very rich and interesting years of our history, there have been four superiors general, SR, Maria Luisa Landesho 1965-1977, SR. Ana Maria Hernes 1977-1987, SR, Rosario Leo 1987-1997, and the current Superior General, SR, Rita Burley, elected in 1997. Although the Institute has not been in a growth phase during these last few years, just as in previous time periods it has been faithful to its universal mission, as understood by our foundresses. It has continued its expansion to new countries and continents, in order to offer a lived message of love, faith, and hope, in, Ecuador 1965, Cameroon, Philippines, and France 1966, India 1968, Israel 1976, Brazil 1981, Scotland 1987, and the Democratic Republic of Congo 1989. At the same time, the number of communities has increased in places where the Institute was already present, focusing on areas where evangelization was insufficient or gravely compromised by educational, social, or economic inequalities, just as the Church and more recent general congregations have urged. A vocation without borders was the great utopian vision of Rafaela Maria, 
and today as well it is a challenge for the handmaids of the 21st century in over 20 countries around the world. 2. Our educational roots and new needs. Vatican II strongly emphasized the great importance of Catholic schools and issued a call for them to open themselves to the new necessities of the time. Attention should be paid to the needs of today in establishing and directing Catholic schools. Therefore, though primary and secondary schools, the foundation of education, must still be fostered, great importance is to be attached to those which are required in a particular way by contemporary conditions. This sacred council of the Church earnestly entreats pastors and all the faithful to spare no sacrifice in helping Catholic schools fulfill their function in a continually more perfect way and especially in caring for the needs of those who are poor in the goods of this world or who are deprived of the assistance and affection of a family or who are strangers to the gift of faith. There are many calls to which the Institute cannot always respond because the Church asks us, at the same time, to not abandon our educational centers because they are a very important means for education in the faith, how to give our students a formation that allows them to mature in their Christian lives in accord with the needs of the world we live in today is a constant concern for all of us. The educational inheritance passed down to us was valued in these times as a privileged means to effect evangelization and the integral formation of youth. Within the apostolic mission of the Institute, dedication to the training of youth in our educational centers is of enduring importance. We must all become aware of the current pressing need for Christian education for the Church and for society. The sisters dedicated to this difficult, but very important task should be encouraged to carry it on with renewed enthusiasm. In the 1970s the fusion of schools and academies is completed. Education for all social classes is the goal, and it is determined that, from now on in all the documents of the Institute, all our educational activities will be included in general and without any distinction under the heading Apostolate of Education and Teaching Centers. In practice, the name used will be that usually employed in each country to indicate the different kinds of education given. The most difficult goal in the educational realm had to do with the academies, given that the former poor schools were free of charge and in some places enjoyed significant economic assistance for their upkeep as was the case of the state-subsidized schools of Spain, where many sisters were considered equivalent when they met the conditions to teachers hired by the government. For the Institute, the democratization of the academies founded before the Council became an urgent call at the institutional level, a call that was supported by the fact that some governments began to underwrite the cost of private education if not entirely, at least at the level of obligatory education. Where it was possible to obtain subsidies for free education, agreements were forged with the appropriate educational authorities. The Institute also asked its schools to investigate how to obtain economic assistance in the various countries, and scholarships are awarded to girls so that they can continue their education in the academies. The writing of the new constitutions, which followed the orientations given by the Church and the demands of the day, is another event of great importance for the congregation. In them, it is clearly expressed that our apostolic action is, Education in service of the gospel. It includes promoting human development, announcing the gospel message and helping peoples to internalize their faith, both as individuals and as members of a community. This education in service of the gospel has a very concrete manifestation in the education and formation of children, youth, and adults, which according to our reparative charism must be carried out from the perspective of the education of the whole person, an education taking place in a pluralistic society. Our education must also promote the attitudes of peace and reconciliation that spring from the Eucharist. At the local, provincial, and even national level, our educational efforts were characterized during this time by the desire for the creation of authentic educational communities, and our work demonstrates collaboration, teamwork, and dialogue. To that end, formation programs for everyone in the educational communities were created. At the same time, our religious communities urgently sought to become true apostolic educational communities that would provide support and living testimony for faith formation. The 1980s and 1890s have been very enriching for our centers. The formation of our students has been carefully looked after, and we have sought adequate ways to empower them to be agents of their own life stories, able to take on the challenges and changes of the future, striving, wherever they are, to live a sense of justice, service, and a fraternal love rooted in the gospel. 
a great effort has also been expended in pastoral ministry, as our educational communities endeavor to make pastoral outreach that which gives meaning to all of our educational activities, so that our centers may be truly a platform for evangelization and fulfill their primary objective. In the area of youth ministry, the approaches have been quite rich, varying according to the contexts and realities of times and places. Groups have come into being which share our identity, in accord with what was suggested by General Congregations 15 and 16. Now is the right time to promote groups of laypeople, or empower those already in existence, who wish to share our charism and spirituality from their lay identity. It is important to open channels of communication and orientation, so that experiences in this field may be shared. This will strengthen the sense of body, throughout the Institute, and foster an approach to a common direction. In this way, our groups have been developing, Grupos ACI which began in Spain in the 1980s and are now extended throughout other parts of Europe, the core groups of Argentina, the Rafaela Marriott groups in Panama, Cameroon, and other places. At the Institute level we are growing in a clear awareness of our mission, communion and networking, and as a result, it is considered important to promote the unity of objectives by way of common mission statements. Those which have come about at the level of individual schools and provinces are being expressed now at the national level. Once again, at the end of the 20th century, there is a call to reflect in depth on the importance of the educational apostolate. Education has an increasing value. Neither circumstances nor the world are changed through violence, but rather through education, to abandon the educational realm would be equivalent to abandoning the evangelization of the world. On the occasion of the 150th anniversary of the birth of St. Rafaela Maria, Sister Rita Burley, in the meeting held in Cordoba with a significant group of teachers in our Spanish schools, reaffirmed the centrality of education. And of one thing I am ever more convinced, the importance of education. Education is what allows us to be protagonists of our own existence and architects of the transformation of society. This is because the fruit of a true education is always a person of integrity, who knows who he or she is and knows the purpose of life, a free person who is not governed by luck, the prevailing culture, the opinions of others, or his or her own weakness, a person with the ability to critique, to appreciate the good, the beautiful, and the true when it comes along, and able as well to reject the interference of egoism which affects so many of the structures of our society. These are the people that the world needs today. A few years later she re-emphasizes the same idea. The handmaids in Spain have made an option for educational centers. For us, our schools are very important platforms for living the mission which St. Rafaela Maria received as a gift for the church and the world. And, although we have other apostolates of education in service of the gospel, we know that this one is very important because of the large number of children and youth whom we can draw to the person and values of Jesus Christ. The Institute does not doubt the importance of teaching and recognizes that despite its limitations, it is indispensable for the individual and social growth of the human person. However, the Institute does re-examine teaching under the light of the new directives of the Church and the needs of the world, so that it may be, once again, faithful to its reparative charism. Looking toward the future, the Institute declares expressly that the congregation dedicates itself to the apostolate in educational activities, which cover all stages of women's formation in its various aspects and are open to all social classes. At the end of 2001, the Institute has 51 educational centers across five continents, some of which belong to other entities, which educate 33,270 students. Early childhood, primary and secondary schools including high schools have 30,050 students. At the university level, there are 2,030 students, who are distributed as follows. The University of Tokyo has 2,103 students, the College of Tokyo Tandai 712, and the Pedagogical School of Chota Peru 477 students. If we compare these data with those of 1964, we can observe that although the number of centers has decreased after the fusion of academies and free schools, the number of students has risen by 11,713. With these figures, it is important to keep in mind that in general, the student population of each center has risen dramatically from what it had been in previous times. It is also important to remember that many countries have striven in the past decades to achieve more widespread childhood education. 
One last factor that has been very important in allowing us to greatly increase our sphere of action has been the collaboration of so many laypersons in our educational undertakings. With the ever greater access of women to university level study in the different parts of the world, the Church asks, once again, that the educational apostolate not forget this means of education. The pastors of the Church are to expend their energies, so that even at universities that are not Catholic there should be associations and university centers under Catholic auspices in which priests, religious and laity, carefully selected and prepared, should give abiding spiritual and intellectual assistance to the youth of the university. Here again, the Institute gives a response to concrete needs in this difficult apostolate, from its social and apostolic mission, so that the young women's process of growth does not take place in isolation from faith. Thirteen university centers and residences were created in these years, although some of them have existed for only a short period of time. At the end of 2001, the Institute had a total of 14 university residences with 754 students in residence, 309 more than in 1964. During this time period, the congregation has carried out important decisions in the educational field. These decisions have allowed us to undertake new actions and look to the future, while remaining faithful to our reparative charism, keeping in mind at all times that reparation must necessarily include repairing one's brother or sister. 3. Reparation and the Option for the Poor On April 30, 1983, S.R. Anna Maria Hernes, then Superior General, writes to all the sisters presenting the new constitutions. Our field of apostolate is immense. There is today much poverty in the world, much injustice, much suffering, and many men and women who have not been evangelized. All of this urges us to offer ourselves without reserve. The spirit of altruism so characteristic of the congregation from its beginnings and its concern for the most needy classes, just as our constitutions demand and the post-conciliar churches, is once again made evident in General Congregation X, where it was declared that our love for the poor and our greater dedication to social work should be manifested. Uh. In an increasing interest in the classes in greatest need, according to the spirit of the constitutions, which is the spirit assigned by the Church to our institute. d. In great liberality in our work, maintaining the gratuitousness of our non-fee-paying schools and catechism classes, etc., and a spirit of detachment from all desire of gain in the apostolic works that are remunerative. c. In sacrificing possible foundations in less necessitous places, and even, if necessary, some of those which already exist, in order to go to places that are intellectually and materially underdeveloped. We should point out, however, that for us the preferential option for the poor does not allow us to exclude anyone, because our mission of reparation, the vital force of the Eucharist and the gospel message we announce impel us to work for justice in love and to keep alive our founder's preference for the poor. Regardless of the position we hold or the social group with whom we work, we want to be one with suffering humanity. We have shown how the Institute, throughout its history, has lived the mandate of Jesus that was so deeply experienced by our foundresses. You will be my witnesses until the end of the earth. Now, in order to be faithful to a fitting renovation, the Institute begins to ask itself, where, today, are the ends of the earth? The response to this question establishes educational works among the most needy. The congregation is dedicated to educational activities, which cover all stages of women's formation in its various aspects and are open to all social classes. However, in the organization of these activities, it must always be kept in mind that it is according to the charism of the Institute to give preference to the education of the poor. Later, it is emphasized that the Institute is to continue to give priority to apostolate with the poor, dedicating the greater part of our apostolic activity to those in most need, those who, in working class areas, slums, rural districts, and underdeveloped countries, are crying out for promotion and are begging our help. The actions carried out by the Institute leave no room for doubt. Between 1965 and 2001, there have been more than 150 foundations, the majority of which have been situated in places where there is an urgent need for human promotion and evangelization. The ends of the earth no longer coincide only with geographical remoteness, but rather with the grave situations of exclusion, of marginalization, situations that one can encounter in many civilized and developed cities where the congregation is present. Our education in service of the gospel, so characteristic of our reparative charism, 
has sought and will continue to seek methods and resources to promote the integral formation of the human person especially among children and youth who do not fit into the current educational systems.